yellow tint of nicotine around the scarlet lacquer of her nails. The L lurches forward. From the plate glass, I can see the engine sway the curve and bend the shadows of the cars against the Rose Hill cenotaphs and mausoleums below, pillars, broken capitals. She's dozing with a crush proof in her fist, henna and crazy rouge, for a pillbox to match her shawl, five black snouted amber eyed mink to which when she wakes, she seems to be talking. Hospital wristband glinting as she lifts her arm, gangsta seeping from the headphones of the kid beside me. Glim, grim, florid music of rebus to which I too am captive. Mother, you are dead 10 years and the dining car will close in 15 minutes in October 1960. Halfway to Seattle for a funeral and the Northwest Limited grates upon its grindstone westward for days. I've been asleep against her shoulder, cheek beside the glistening fur. She's unhooked and pillowed for me, eyes to the golden, unblinking eyes, stitched mouth stowny and talcum and shalimar. I crane my neck, the engine in twilight leaning the curve. We've been waiting for the tunnel, 1.7 miles long, both fighting sleep, the fur and her smell so close they're breathing me. Erection, but I'm too young to call it that, warm inside my dungarees against her arm, against her dozing arm, the Salem she lit pulsing down. For nine days, lifetime upon lifetime, the rebel angels plummeted, tenfold confusion in their fall, downward rush, clamorous whistle of skin rent endlessly, headlong since Milton, headlong themselves they threw. Against your arm, against your dozing arm, the tunnel yawning receives us whole. Sting of menthol, shalimar, birthmark, sweet abrasions bristling my neck, bringing me your profile back. Then vortex, spasm, sudden dark within the car, the glow, the flicker, ash. Um, this next poem is from a new book I'm working on. The review published it a couple of years ago. Uh, the book seems to be about extinct animals and dead languages. It's a jolly book. Huh? <laughs> we, you know, we associate that term stool pigeon with Jimmy Cagney movies usually, but um, actually the origins of that word are even stranger. Uh, stool pigeons um, were... Um, in the 19th century when passenger pigeons still existed, adult male passenger pigeons that hunters would uh, capture. They'd sew their eyes shut and then tie them to wooden stakes uh, so their cries of distress would attract other passenger pigeons who are very empathic, empathic beings. Um, and while they were doing that, um, people would net thousands of them and then systematically kill them um, so, uh, anyway, the poem's called Decoy Birds. You also, there's a reference to the Vanshi Conference. You probably know what that was. Decoy Birds. Consider it. To so shut the eyes of the living bird must have required a certain delicacy uncharacteristic of hunters. Blue thread a tremble in your meaty hands, the needle eye pierced, the glassy pupils shut like sarcophagi, and all the while the bird is writhing. Needle too deep and the thing will bleed out, and all the while the cry will issue forth, a breathy panicked coo. You've sewn up the eyes of an adult male passenger pigeon. The breast, fat and salmon-hued, heaves as the bird is placed among a dozen wheeling others in a crude wire pen. They veer and stagger and collide, the shimmering and stupid bait. Tomorrow, the hunt. You pin the blind bird's feet to posts in a forest clearing, each set 20 paces apart. Fluttering, they attract the migrating, empathic 
flocks, tens of thousands, so many they eclipse the sun. Settling earthward, they're entangled in fantastic nets capable of confining 2,000 birds. And thus you venture out and the real work commences. You've likely hired Mix and Dagos, Darkies or Cherokees, the desperate who work shit jobs for shit wages, but sufficiently trained to slink upon the nets armed with hammers to dispatch the vast seethe and flutter. Hard to bend down, hard to target the glossy heads, and the labor seems endless. Two miles off, the boxcars wait to be filled, barrel upon barrel crammed with birds and peddled in Cleveland and Chicago. Eichmann's notes from the Vanshi conference address in special detail the problem of morale. How can even SS shoot Jew after Jew in the head all day and not feel the deepest exhaustion? And in the case of assimilated, German-speaking Jewry, those who likely would wail for mercy in the soldier's own tongue, how do you complete the task without occasional regret, remorse, etc.? And a further practical concern, the expense of ammunition. In time, these logistical challenges would be addressed and solved. Always the mechanics are addressed and solved. It is noon. You pull your rucksack for a whistle made of brass and signal that the men may pause the killing and begin their midday repast. Beneath a tree, they sp spread their bedrolls and sit, the dung so caked and chalky, the ground seems besnowed. This man lifts a boiled egg, another a loaf of soda bread, a flagon of apple jack, swigged and shared, their English gullied, Irish, Napolitinoed, punctuated with American fuck this, fuck that. Seven more hours and they'll call it a day. The green stupendous net beside them hums with wing beats of the birds still unslaughtered. A white-capped lake rain pocked in a summer storm. Um, last poem is about my sons. Uh, we kind of quixotically tried gardening for a little while, um, growing tomatoes, in fact. And, you know, once you start to do that, people uh, give you the most fabulous mythology and lore about, like, how to get away, keep the uh, the squirrels and the raccoons away. Um, you know, marigolds are supposed to do it. Uh, human hair is supposed to do it. Um, and worst of all, Irish spring soap. So that's in the poem. Um, there's also, and I have to say it with some embarrassment, a passage in which I try to do a not very credible imitation of David Byrne singing Once in a Lifetime. <laughs> Talismanic. The boy's hair voodoos the tomato stalks. We have swept it from the kitchen floor after haircuts and straw colored it spirals from the garden soil, already half buried, like tablets itch etched with linear B, untranslatable among eggshells and soap flakes. I kneel and watch it rain upon the diligent grubs, beetles, and the zigzagging caravan of ants. The stalks nod with unriped big boys, calypsos, green marbles of cherries in clusters. Human hair, marigolds, Irish spring I flake with a cheese grater in a talismanic circle charm against squirrel and raccoon. High summer evening, high 90s, and the boys run tonsured through the sprinkler spray, the sound as it revolves a quirky but robotic staccato, like the voice of David Byrne cackling once in a lifetime. You may ask yourself, how do I work this? 
they will lay waste to the fruits of your labors. Useless are all your spells. For now the wind is rising, a thick, cheap scent over everything. Scent the color of key lime pie. Scent the color of my father, twenty years dead and stepping from the shower stall, taking in the steam and deep self-conscious breaths. His own futile talisman against emphysema, angina, Jim Beam, soap lather beards his face. You may ask yourself, how did I get here? He is ash in a canister in the Veterans Cemetery in St. Paul, and his DNA helixes up the pale outline of Luke's spine, glinting now in the sprinkler's jittery rainbows. Let the water hold me down. Back and forth they pace the sprinkler's cage. They squeal and turn to me in their delight. Same as it ever was. Same as it ever was. And the breeze pulls the spray toward me until I am missed as well. Lord, abide this instant back to them when I am ash. Though I kneel absurdly with the cheese grater, knee pads and a flint head of soap, same as it ever was, same as it ever was. Sundown, mosquitoes tuning up, a guilt of fireflies slathering the Adirondack chairs. My knees scrape eggshell, beflowered with deadheaded marigolds, and the tufts of hair billow up from the dirt to my face.